Hi, everyone. This is Tom Broussard. Great to see everyone. I'm talking today about a, a PhD researcher, a doctor, Brendan Milner, uh, from used to be from the UK and then Canada. Um, and she is really, really, really quite something. And I know all the other scientists I've been talking to you about uh, so far this year have all been amazing. Um, Brenda is another amazing person, not the least is that she was born in 1918 and she's still alive and still quite peppy. Um, so that's 105 years old. Um, the, uh, the, the article ends with talking about her being um, standing up on the shoulders of so many other scientists. Uh, sort of starting with that, because she is one of those who stood on the shoulders of and others stood on hers, stood on hers going forward. Um, given this incredible long amount of time as a working scientist um, up in Montreal, where she works and lives, although she's told me she's uh, one of her staff told me um, that she's not working anymore, but I believe that she probably still is because they started interviewing her when she was about 87. That's the first time I saw they did other interviews with her. But in this particular time, um, she was 87 and they did an interview of thinking, you know, getting older. Um, then they did it again when she was 90, then 95, then 97 and then 100. <laughs> and they did it again at 103. Um, so I've been reading all these interviews with her and she's really quite funny. Um, so uh, it is interesting that she has spanned that amount of time. So all of you who have been watching my series about the scientist and the brain and aphasia. Um, uh, she is number 14 uh, out of the 24. So we're finally getting closer to the end. Um, by the end of this year, end of December, we will have finished 24 uh, articles for the year, which I desperately wanted to do when we started this in uh, earlier this year, but I didn't know if I could make it work, but it seems like we'll make it in time. Um, and she is sort of this, this, uh, uh, this hinge between all the early uh, scientists and now all the newer ones still coming up. I say new, although quite a few of them are quite, quite a, pretty much this about the same time because she's 105. So a lot of these people go all the way back and all the way forward. And uh, not that she met everyone, but she met a tremendous number who then knew all the rest. Um, so it's really this hinge between the two. So you get to see, although I'll talk a little bit about her, of course, but it's hard to see, or it's amazing to see that with her, because of her work, just because of the luck of the draw, um, that she came to the United States after World War II um, and just by happenstance met um, Heb, which we've talked about recently. Then with Heb uh, in Montreal, then with, with Milner, Brenda, and then meeting uh, and working with um, Wilder uh, Penfield. So that's three that you now know about. Um, but then finding out to know more about Heb and Lashley, of course, before him, um, and through uh, Pen uh, uh, Penfield going to, obviously, an American, uh, went to Europe, again, with World War II, and then Penfield met uh, Sherrington, um, who had met um, Santiago uh, Ramon y Cajal, the, the Spanish scientist. Um, uh, and of course, Shillington also had met um, uh, Broca and Jackson. So you get to see this, this list of, of Shillington, Penfield, uh, Kajal, uh, Jackson, Lashley. Oh, I forgot to mention Head because Head is a tremendous person working with Jackson and really helped Jackson better understand what was going on, that, that uh, Jackson had figured out a lot 
but back then, as he wrote it, not many people really fully understood what he was trying to say. And that took another 50 years to get to where we are here today. But again, 50 years for him, well, again, uh, Milner, Brendan, was still alive and working hard on all these issues going forward. Uh, again, bringing us up to what Jackson had written about 100 years ago, um, which is continues to be amazing going forward. So Brenda, um, born in 1918, as I mentioned, um, uh, and uh, met her husband there during the war. They were doing work for the armed services there. And uh, after the war, they left on the Queen Elizabeth uh, as uh, war brides, you get to see, um, coming in this direction to Boston and then to um, Montreal, where in fact, uh, her husband had gotten a job to work on on that up in Montreal. Um, the um, While there, of course, she had just finished her own bachelor's and then her master's at um, Cam Cambridge. Um, and then started working on her PhD and working under uh, Heb, who was his dissertation chair. Um, so it was interesting how much traveling, I've mentioned that before, in the 18s and 19, early 1900s, people do travel a lot between the US and other countries around Europe. And um, Heb and, uh, had traveled, so, and Lashley also had traveled many, many times, as did Penfield. Um, back and forth, back and forth. And uh, uh, Brenda uh, continued to work with either <laughs> Heb, as Heb had went back and forth with different, different organizations, as well as Penfield. Um, but it was amazing that they all did that. And uh, when Brenda wrote her, her PhD, uh, even her husband really started to like the brain side of things. And he also shifted from electricity, which is what he used to do, um, and got his own PhD in the same, similar, same way. Um, but as he worked, as Brenda worked with Penfield, and there's a picture in the article, a picture of the two of them at a meeting um, uh, that you see in the article. I also have a picture of Heb and also Penfield in the last article, I was looking for and trying to find a picture that would have all three of them in the same room, which they did many, many, many times, but I still hadn't found one before I had to uh, uh, send this uh, article out. Although I did send this article last week to Brenda uh, and at least her staff, because that's I'm sure where I got the info before, um, just to say, if you get a chance, please take a look at it and see if I made any really big mistakes. Uh, in the article, but I haven't heard back. So now hopefully if it's a mistake, now the world gets to see it going forward. Um, but after doing all the work with uh, Penfield um, and doing a lot of work with the with the brain and with, with uh, Penfield uh, mapping the brain, you might remember how he had, uh, when he opened them up and he was looking at the, at, the, uh, at the brain, he would tag them, uh, A, B, C, or one, two, three, of various folds as he was then using that <clears throat> that um, prong to tell, because the patient was still awake, to tell if um, he was able to communicate or not and realizing where he could or couldn't go too far uh, that would make a person um, aphasic, um, which they did, although temporarily, because while holding that electrical prod, um, they become aphasic but removing that, it would go away. And um, um, another uh, brain uh, damaged patient of another doctor <clears throat> in the United States uh, got a hold of Penfield um, and said, I have another patient. His name is, what they usually call him is HM. His real name is Henry Mol Molali, Molali's son. Um, they couldn't use the full name until he passed, but he lived a long, long time, but he had a brain operation to try and stall, uh, forestall his uh, seizures. And as a result of that, uh, removed a large part of the brain 
and all of them finding out that what they had done was made his, his short-term memory disappear. Um, so uh, that turned out that that's uh, where uh, the short-term um, memory uh, and the, con the conversion into long-term goes through the hippo campus, which is part of what was destroyed uh, on purpose, trying to stop this terrible, terrible surgeries that uh, surgeries um, surgeries he was having. Um, but that's when they found out that he had lost his short-term memory. And but he was very happy pay person, and he did all the work he could to help people better understand how his brain was or wasn't working for him. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it turns out that Brenda was the one who was called um, when they needed a certain kind of person, a certain kind of scientist, and she started going um, down to the United States, um, to uh, Hartford, Connecticut, uh, for 50 years, <laughs> working with that same patient for 50 years. There were other people who also um, were part of that um, study, but she was the lead person for all of that. So for 50 more years, she worked with uh, HM, um, to better understand, be able to write about it with articles by both uh, Hebb and Penfield, uh, as well as the, the other doctor, the doctor who actually did the, the surgery. Um, his name is Schofield. Um, because although they got a hold of Penfield and um, uh, Brenda, neither one had operated on HM. That's the uh, um, Schofield is the one who did that. <clears throat> so all that time, she has been writing about it. And as a matter of fact, let's see if I actually have it. Yes, you should all get a copy of this. That's HM. And you get to hear an awful lot more about how um, Brenda had done all that work for, again, for 50 years, but was able to do that and continue long after that because HM HM did live for a long, long time, uh, which was also uh, very helpful uh, for him as well as for all the scientists who were studying him. Um, but at that point, um, the uh, Lashley, who had been trying to work on the memory and, and what's been described as the engram, um, and really realizing that the, that the memory is really uh, diffused throughout the, the brain, um, still looking for the where it would actually hold the information physically mechanically hold the memory um and at least in this particular um uh, uh part of memory because it really comes in through any number of of uh, uh, uh processes in terms of the way the memory works uh, that the short-term memory uh is localized in the hippocampus and that is how another um, scientist wrote about uh, an article called the, the Heroes of the Engram. And it's amazing because he talked about the five people, the heroes, and they are now Seaman, who you might remember because you saw, hit, saw his appearance in the um, Lashley article. Um, he is the one who first came up with the word uh, Engram. He is a, a German, a German uh, scientist. So the five is Simmons, uh, Penfield, Lashley, Hebb, and Brenda, as well as two other people who I really didn't know, but I read some about, about them. And you see some quotes from uh, one of them, Richard, Richard Thompson. Thompson, Thompson. Um, the, that in fact, and that's where I end this article with the uh, uh, Brenda stood on the shoulders of so many other scientists who were looking for memory and looking for the engram. Um, and that's the end of it. And I started at the beginning of this um, uh, video. Um, Richard, Richard, Richard uh, Topsom talked about that and quotes with the fact that, um, uh, as, as he said here, and I'll read it for you, the discoveries we have made will be listed in the textbooks as facts not associated with names. And this is as it should be. Unlike other approaches to knowledge, science knowledge is cumulative. And in this particular case, Brenda Milner 
um, has held a tremendous amount of cumulative knowledge that she continues to display for all of us going forward at 105 up in Montreal. Um, I'm very close to Montreal. We've been there several times. The next time we go there, I am praying that she is still there and uh, if possible, see her um, or at least go to her office. I understand the office is still there and be able to at least gaze at her work, uh, meaning all the works that she had done that's, that's visible there at the university, at the neuro, as they refer to it. But thank you very much. This was a great turn um, moving from the 14. She's the 14th article, now 10 more to go. And her being the sort of the pivotal of all of this since she was working on this before World War II and continued through today. Thank you very much. Nice to see everyone and see you next time. See you next week. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.